Hi guys, it's Bella. Today I am back with another Japan video. Um, lucky for you, we're actually going to be taking a look into the Hokkaido countryside today to see how Japan promotes sustainable agriculture. Yes, my friends, me and some of my classmates went to Meadow Village Farm to take a look at community supported agriculture and how this specific farm is changing the face of what it means to take care of the earth and what it means to take care of each other. Community supported agriculture. Now, if you're anything like me, you probably had or have no idea what community supported agriculture is. We asked um, a local farmer there how he does CSA, what it means, why it's important. Um, and I learned a lot of really cool things, but I think the most important thing that we should be discussing today is um, how valuable food is and how valuable our environment is. We really need to start taking a harder look at how we can um, be better consumers, how we can um, promote sustainable living and, and how we can give to each other. In light of today's political atmosphere, I think it's really important to start having some of these discussions. So um, without further ado, I hope this video is insightful and that you enjoy it. Thank you for watching. Um, come back next time for some of my other videos. So, check it out. Hey, welcome to Minnow Village. My name is Ray. I've been farming here for 23 years and would like to welcome you to our farm. Um, I've been involved with farming here and one of the reasons why people <laughs> people often wonder why I, I farm here in Japan. And one of the main reasons why I've come and to farm and be a part of this, uh, this community is that present industrialized agricultural system has been causing a lot of environmental damage and has resulted in the loss of interest amongst young people and also an aging rural population. Uh, one of the basic things about farming and food is that everybody needs food in order to live. We need to rethink the way food moves between farm and table and also the connection between eaters and farmers. Is it possible to create an agriculture that serves the needs of people, takes care of the land, and provides people, uh, farmers in particular, uh, with a viable income? 
I would welcome you to come and join me on the 28th. 28th, yeah. And we'll see what kind of what comes out of our conversations together. With this storage facility, we'll be we're able to market potatoes ten months of the year without using any outside energy sources. So we can provide uh, fresh mm -hmm. <laughs> potatoes for our CSA members, mm -hmm. you know, for ten months of the year. Traditionally, farmers had uh, what was called uh, suchimuro. They just dug dug a small small pit and then they put the potatoes in there mm -hmm. and then put mm -hmm. uh, water on top and then covered it with uh, soil and they, they could store their potatoes until March you know when the, as the snow is melting they'll dig it open and then they'll pack mm -hmm. the potatoes but you can't take the potatoes out during the winter time mm -hmm. they're, they're there for the through the course of the winter and then in the springtime you open up the, the storage and then you can uh, sell sell down. Um, what's nice about having a facility like this is that we can market, you know, right through the winter, and also during during the uh, fall when everyone is wanting to har you know, are harvesting potatoes, and they take it to the Ichiba. That's when the prices are the lowest. Mm -hmm. So if we want to sell all of our potatoes at one time in the fall, well, we wouldn't get very much for them. In fact, there's been times in which I've sold potatoes at the market in Sapporo, in which I got less money for them than the cost of the box that I put them in. Um. We grow two varieties of potatoes. We grow, we grow this variety and also... Our, our potatoes weren't so good last year uh, because of all the rains. Uh, we also grow peat nakari. Smetai. 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 And they're... They're not shiwa mara shiwa shiwa not the nice thing. Katai. Katai. They're not they're not drying out and therefore they're still hard. Oh. If the if the humidity would be low, then the moisture would be taken out of mm. out of the vegetables and then they would get soft. Mm. So humidity is a hundred percent in here. And this is what I like to explain to people, like when you heat your house, what is the coldest surface in the house? Mm the windows mm -hmm. and that's where condensation happens mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. the windows mm -hmm. well in this storage facility what is the coldest place mm -hmm. there the snow mm -hmm. <laughs> the snow there's snow in here mm -hmm. so there's no there's a no. little bit of moisture a little bit mm -hmm. but you know it's there's no con very little condensation that happens other places because that's the coldest place so when the snow melts when all the snow disappears then the walls and the potatoes become the coldest place and they'll start getting wet so we want to make sure that as soon as the snow melts mm -hmm. we want to open up this mm -hmm. storage and ventilate it so that it dries out with this storage facility we have this packing area here we can we can uh, pack potatoes and ship potatoes year-round. In the winter time, if it's snowing outside, then you can still be packing potatoes here and they're not going to freeze. And we can load them up in the truck and take them to, to support. There's about 900 oil presses all over Japan in villages. Inaka no sakyujo. Ippai atta. Kashogura atta. Five years all gone. In which all the this whole in nineteen between nineteen sixty 1960 and nineteen sixty five they started they bulldozed all the hatake and made rice fields. And so the the these farm subsidies were shifted over to rice production. So most farmers started growing rice and they started using tractors and started buying chemical fertilizers. Uh, so the flowers disappeared. But at the same time, at the same time, the major oil oil processors in Japan, Fujiabra, Nishinabra, mm -hmm. went to Canada. And the researchers in Canada were working on the uh, low uric acid uh, canola canola.
variety of grapeseed. Oh. And the presidents of these companies said that once this variety is developed, there has been, they committed themselves to buying 100% of Japan's canola oil. I don't know, Natani Abro <laughs> from Canada, the seeds, the, the rapeseed from uh, Canada. Uh, what, what, why Canada? The Canadian agricultural policy for the, there is this one desk selling in Canada. There's a supply management of uh, grains and also for eggs and dairy products as well. But the, in order to provide a fair price to all the Canadian farmers, the government paid for all of the shipping costs to the port so that no matter where the farmers lived, mm. all the farmers got exactly the same price. The land freight cost to the port was paid by paid for by the Canadian government. 99.6% of the of the canola oil that is consumed in Japan is squeezed at seven facilities. And most of those are located right next to the ports. Mm. Previously these oil, this oil processing was ha happened at the village level. The oil was squeezed and it was for the regional consumption. All the meal was then used for livestock feed or used to make fertilizer locally. So it didn't, things didn't move very much. But now, how's, how is AO Jumcon happening? How is nutrients being recycled back to the land. It's not happening. It's not happening. We also grow wheat and mm -hmm. uh, they also, Nokio says that you can't grow wheat without using chemicals. Well, that's not true. Uh, we, um, we, we have a small bakery that we built, that, that I built over in this house here. And so we, we grow, we, we grow wheat you know, from seed to loaf. We have all the processing facilities right here. So we make our own flour and then we can we can bake it into bread right here as well. When you do those kind of things, well then uh, a farmer can make a living. <laughs> it's really hard for farmers to make a living if you're wanting to try and wholesale stuff. You know, um, I'll give you another example. We grow, we grow a small amount of soba. Well, soba flour, if you have a mill, soba flour sells for about 2,500 yen a kilo. So one bag of soba would mean about 75,000 yen of income, rather than 10,000 yen. That's significant. We uh, take our, our um, soba to a processor and we make noodles. Mm -hmm. dried noodles and we sell those 200 gram for 460 yen. We also mix some of our wheat in with that as well. So that's one way that small farms can not only survive but also actually thrive uh, in the present context. If people want to know where their food comes from and how, how the how the wheat moves from this field to the flour mill to their bread. I can come here and take a look. take the bran, we take that to the, some of it we mix back into our flour, uh, some of it then we'll take to the chickens. So there's really, there's nothing that we throw away. <laughs> if we can't, if we can't use it to eat, well then yes. we have to think we, we take it to our livestock and if that's not an option, we also 
make up coal heating oil? So, yeah, you know, like the capital investment involved in the mill and sifter. I like Goju mm. Goju And for what we basically do with uh, having, having this mill and sifter, it means we more than double our income on wheat. Mm -hmm. And this is, we do this during the, you know, well, we'll do this during the summertime, but also when there's a lot of snow outside, rather than go play pachinko or, mm -hmm. or get an outside job, we, we're, we work here at home. We'll, we're doing flour milling and baking, and we make our fertilizer during the winter time. Mm -hmm. It's more profitable for us to stay home mm -hmm. than to try and get an outside job to make money mm -hmm. and then buy fertilizer. Mm -hmm. It's maybe good for the GDP, mm -hmm. but it's not good for our, for our, our household income. Mm -hmm. You're developing your infrastructure, you know, that's with any starting any business. You know, mm -hmm. That's basically yeah. basically the case. And then I think about the eighth year mm -hmm. when our is when our CSA members also began to understand what this project was all about. Uh, yeah, it took a lot of education. Mm -hmm. Like um, we have every week, we would publish a newsletter to go along with our deliveries, so we could explain, you know, why we're doing what we're doing, provide information about the vegetables. We were, we introduced new vegetables that really didn't exist in Japan at the time. Often city people, they're almost more upset about us forgetting the newsletter in the box than they were <laughs> like, where's my newsletter? <laughs> we, my, my wife Aki, she, she published the, this year? the f two years, the first two years of, uh, of our farms. Do you can keep letter. a rec record? Yeah. Can, yeah. can we have a... Really oh, it was a huge, huge file, like you know, 18 years of, 20 years of newsletters. <laughs> but the soul mm. doesn't speak. Mm. It doesn't, it doesn't cry, <laughs> you know, yeah. but you know, you need to learn, like seeing what kind of weeds are growing. You can mm. tell some things about the condition of the soil. Uh, and I find that the weeds change over time if you have a calcium deficiency. Uh, you're going to have like gishi gishi, like deep rooted weeds growing that are going to be pulling up calcium from deep down. When you have high pH levels, all of a sudden I notice that feel here that gishi gishi just disappeared like this, what is it, soil? Mm -hmm. right? The English word for gishi gishi is soil. It disappeared. And I just, uh oh. <laughs> Uh, I was, we were having some trouble with uh, Socopio, which is, uh, what is it, scab on potatoes. And that scab is made worse by high soil pH. Wow. And that was a big problem last year. It was over 7, over seven with a pH of 7. And five. potatoes like 5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I, like, did, three years ago, we got like 20 tons of uh, cracked, uh, Soybeans from uh, from the milk hill. This past year, less than three. So, as a farmer, well, then I have to think: what are other sources of nitrogen fertilizer? And uh, mm. hairy vetch will do it for <laughs> for free. But you know, go, growing cover crops. We're going to be thinking about growing cover crops. And two, at this time of year, like in in a little over a day, this. Uh, these, this fertilizer will start heating up. It will heat up to like 130, 140 degrees. Like even throughout the winter? Even the winter will take a few more days in order to reach those temperatures, but yeah. This is still has a little bit of heat left in it, but... It also ferments in the water. And the water turns to like, what is the Japanese, toro toro? It's like this green moss grows in the rice field, and then the uh, weeds have a hard time. The sunlight doesn't reach all the way down to the soil, so it affects the weed seed germination. So, 
this is a mixture of, of chicken manure and there's uh, soybeans, uh, cracked soybeans. We had a few beans that had were left over that we had, and we just these uh, what I don't know these uh, they were they were old beans, mm. and we just put in here. Um, there's uh, okara from a from a Naganuma tofu maker, mm -hmm. and also from Kuriyama. Mm -hmm. It's sanki haiki It's mm -hmm. It, they would have to pay a company in order to mm -hmm. dispose of it, yeah. and they said if you if you want it, you can have it. So we, it's close by. We go and pick it up and mix it with our fertilizer and the fertilizer on it, and they're happy. I'm happy. There's some cover crops like rye mm -hmm. that has a ha, has a, an allelopathic effect, like it doesn't like having other plants growing around it. So. Growing, we also have rye in our in our crop rotation. Um, for some cover crops, well, like actually soba, buckwheat is also a good crop to grow if you want to smother out weeds. In order, if you have a weed problem in the field, just plant soba, mm -hmm. and then you know it it grows so fast that it outcompetes the weeds for sunlight that the we, the weeds end up not, you know, are, they're suppressed. Um, other c crops, you know, to mix into a rotation, like uh, clovers and vetches, will help fix nitrogen. So then you don't have to buy as much chemical fertilizer or to buy so much fertilizer. A wheat crop you plant in the fall, and in springtime, you could plant. Uh, Go in with the broadcaster and just broadcast the seeds into the standing crop mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. doing any kind of cultivation. And that growing crop will serve as a, what's called a, they call it a nurse crop. It'll kind of protect those little seeds that kind of shade the ground so that those tiny seeds will germinate. And then once you take your crop off, then sun shines into the crop, then you have your cover crop will grow, which will also help suppress weeds, fix nitrogen, so then you don't have to buy as much chemical fertilizer. We try to always keep our crop, our fields covered with something yeah. in order to prevent soil erosion and also to help build up organic matter. I, I, you know, I, I grew up on a farm. I studied sus about sustainable agriculture with Wes Jackson at the Land Institute, uh, and was exposed to ideas of Wendell Berry. Uh, and also, I was exposed to a book there called "Farmers of Forty Centuries." Mm -hmm. Have you heard of this book? Everyone study organic farming knows this book. Yeah. It's yeah. The beginning of everything the organic farm yeah in the the roots of organic agriculture mm. in the United States and also the soil association in Britain can mm. be traced back to this book called farmers of 40 centuries and it was a book that was written by a gentleman from Wisconsin Wisconsin I go to school in Wisconsin yeah <laughs> yeah and there's uh in the agricultural department, there's there's King Hall, F. H. King Hall, in uh, at the University of Wisconsin Madison. He taught there, and uh, he worked for the U. S. Department of Agriculture for a few years, and he thought American agriculture was on the wrong track. In the in the late 1800s, there was this general idea that. There are, there are so many trees in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, we can never cut them all down. There is so much soil fertility in the American soils, we can never use up all the fertility. We can just take and never think about returning anything. 
That was the attitude. And King thought, you know, that that's suicidal. America, you know, if America doesn't look after its soils, eventually American, you know, America will fail as a country. He started thinking to himself, you know, where in the world is there an agriculture that's last a long time? And so he decided to come to Japan, China, Korea to study about agriculture here. Because how, how could it be that for 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years, farming the same fields, harvesting rice from the same rice fields, how do we do that? You know, America, the, the idea was, well, we farm in one place for 20, 30 years, use up all the organic matter, and then move west. There's always more land farther west. What, what he found in, in countries here in Asia is that everybody, city people, farmers, they cared about the soil. And all waste went back to the field, including human waste. King asked his interpreter, you know, like, you know, like, you know, why do you use human waste? Yeah. And put it back on the fields. And the, the interpreter said, do you know what he said? Human waste is, you know, is, is too, it's too precious to just yeah. throw it away. The alternative at that point in time was starvation. People didn't care about the soil. Wouldn't be able to harvest crops or die. This is an island nation. There was no international trade, <laughs> or much of any international trade happening. You know, in 1900. Every every week we go to Sapporo for delivery. There's about 40, 40 different households that we're, that we're delivering to, and uh, you know through this network, like we do a lot of our own our own building, construction, and machine maintenance, and building maintenance, and some of our members are building contractors, and electricians, and paint shop owners, you know, so we can get different supplies, you know, for our, to support our life. And we're supporting their business as well, you know, so, like, we have um, a, there's a we have a 28 kilowatt solar array mm -hmm. which we're selling about fourteen thousand dollars worth of electricity a year so that we have a 20-year contract on that and we'll pay for the system in about ten and a half to eleven years so we'll have a nine years of free electricity and I work directly with a electrician that I know in Sapporo and uh, we bought the whole system by ourselves and then and then we worked together with this guy to, to make a, a separate contract a lot of the farmers here that they put up solar after the uh, what, 311 after the uh, Genpatsu Mondai the meltdown and they worked together with these kind of solar companies so they the interest rates that they they're charging and also the price of the system well they're promising them well you'll get about ichiman niman per month you know of income you know. And it's not very good not very good terms that they got but they're generating a little bit of income but it's most of the money is going to the to the solar solar company what i'm most concerned about is farmers rights and patents on seeds um, that's that for me is a huge issue, and that has nothing to do about with science. It has to do with politics. A farmer would grow biotech rice two meters from my fields. Would the pollen from those rice fields come and contaminate my fields? And if they would, that would mean that the uh, seed company who developed the variety would have the legal right to take my crop. <sighs> The lawyers in Canada and the United States said it doesn't matter how the genes end up in your field. The point is, is that you are in possession of a company's intellectual property. 
It doesn't matter if the wind blew it there or a bee brought it into your field. That's Konkenite. We also have chicken in the house over here. About 90% of the, of the feed that is these chickens eat comes from this town. <laughs> There's no ammonia smell. What do you think of the chickens? Uh, I love a chicken. You love them? What if, uh, like, a 21st century or next century, uh -huh. we can have large-scale mm -hmm. uh, farm machine mm -hmm. and, and produce enough for the uh, everyone on the earth, mm -hmm. and you don't need to work; you just stay home. The mechanization, roboticization that is yeah. happening. We're not going to need people. We'll be able to do all of the production with machines. There won't be enough work for everybody. So we'll just give everyone a basic income and just... The question of, of food. Uh, it's going to cost money. You know, these machines are not free. And the investors that invest in these kind of high-tech farming operations, which will take a lot of capital. You know, yeah. It won't take people, but it'll take a lot of capital in order to make these work. If people don't have money, they won't have access to food. Look at the word community. What is the, the root? Com is like the same root as the word common, companion, compassion, communion. There's something that, the communion is something, there is something that you share together. Mm -hmm. Either a common conviction or a practice that you share in common. That's what communion and community is all about. And all the people that live in the same neighborhood, the same cheeky, do they have something, some core conviction that they share together, that they act on as a group? Companion. Pan. 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 Bread. Bread. Yeah. Pan. Companion is nice. Very good. The whole line. A companion is somebody that you desire to share bread with. It's a great They wouldn't be willing to eat the things that we grow. We couldn't make a living here. So they're very special people. And one of the questions that came up was, well, about how do you 
make these connections. There's things that I care about. Mm -hmm. I care about family. I care about this farm. And when I experience things that threaten my life or threaten the existence of my farm, well, I can't stay silent. And so I, I speak out. Mm -hmm. I write things in our Yes I Diary, our newsletter. Or if there's something, you know, with the biotech issue when that started rising, I, I did some writing on that topic. And then people invited me to speak in a local gathering of Seikatsu Club members. So I would go there to speak. And then all of a sudden, well, then I'd get invited to speak somewhere else. And through these contacts, because I care about what's happening, and become members of our farm. Become, enter into that circle of people who care. Uh, there's a lot of people who care about agriculture that they don't have the opportunity, don't know mm -hmm. what to do. So do you think that maybe part of the key to change the narrative of people not caring or is education? and Advocacy, awareness, things yes, like that. Definitely. We need linguistics. You talk about linguistics. Mm. This present system, the food system that we are a part of, is a cultural narrative. It has a story to tell. And what it is doing is it is, it is a story that is really not about creating life, but it's if you look at what's happening, it's creating destruction and death. Leading to people not caring for one another. People are isolated, not knowing what to do. We need a new narrative. We need a new story to tell. One that is bringing people together and gives giving up people an opportunity to care and speak out and act on behalf of the needs of life. We don't have, we haven't been using our imagination enough to create structures that reflect what is good. And connecting people and, and caring, for, caring for the land. What I hope for is that people will wake up and, and see that the, this isn't only for the sake of helping farmers, but it is for our own, for our own personal integrity. Mm -hmm. I need, city people, I need to be involved in order to maintain my own humanity. What does it mean to be a human being? By participating together in partnership with farmers. Not everybody's gonna farm. You know, that's not gonna happen. But is there ways in which city people can work together with people who know how to grow food that will make good agriculture possible? By good agriculture, what I mean by good. Uh, an agriculture that maintains the fertility of soil for a long time, sustainable, if you want to use the word sustainable agriculture. What we need to be able to look at this system, what is it doing to people? What is it doing to the land? And for our own sake of our own human dignity, say that there's something that's wrong and this is not what it means to be human. I need to participate in doing something which is, I feel, personally I feel good about. What would happen if people started living as if people cared for one another? And people actually, you know, cared about what's going on in the world. What would that look like? Start imagining that. <laughs> because growing food is more than just feeding. I like
moving energy in your body. It's creating a culture of caring. I, I feel that that's... Somebody asked a question about, you know, how do you get young people interested in farming? Well, I, I told my, and my second son is interested mm. in starting an artisan dairy. Mm. Um, <laughs> he's, what, well, he's 20. He just turned 20. 